Hi, my name is Anne Vedendiger and welcome to the third and the last lecture on um, image design and composition. But this week we w I want to um, talk to you about the use of colour in image design. Before we start the lecture and I know when we start speaking about the, the use of colour in image design, I thought it might be useful just to have a look uh, at the language or the type of language that we use in photography. Uh, when we speak about colour and also the difference between the language that we, we use in photography and the language that's used in the visual arts. Both are valuable and to have a little bit of knowledge about both is also very valuable for you as a young photographer. So in photography when we refer to colour, we refer to colour as hue, saturation and luminance. So hue refers to the purity or the pure colour or the colour of it, the colour itself. It's defined by the main wavelength contained in the colour, for example, red, green or blue light. Saturation refers to the purity of the colour. So when we think about working with pigments, when, it's, when pigments are mixed with white or black, it it um, results in lower saturation. But when we're talking about the use of colour in photography and saturation, it's still the purity of the colour, but it's how the tonal, the underlying tonal values impact on that saturation. Luminance is the brightness of the colour. That is how much light that that colour will reflect. When we start looking at black and white photography, um, this is really an important piece of knowledge to have because the amount of light that each image reflects will then impact heavily on the tonal values within your black and white image. So when we think about um, colour as well, there are two major colour systems which define colour and provide specific numerical values for each colour. They are the Munsell system and the CIE system. So the Munsell system was developed by an American artist, um, A.H. Munsell, and it's a standard for classifying the classification of printing inks, colour, pigments and artist paints. So what he's designed is a series of colour charts and printed colour swatches with assigned numbers. These assigned numbers are useful for um, describing or defining colours for print. It's a little bit similar to the Pantone system, if any of you are, sim are familiar with that Pantone colour system. The other system, CIE system, is much more useful for the classification of colour in photography. So it, it classifies colour by equating them to the amount of red, green and blue light required to produce a colour. The CIE system shows colour graphically so that that colour may be defined by its X and Y values. If you think about the colour picker in Adobe Photoshop and, and over on the, um, in the info, if you choose a colour you'll see that there's a mixture of red, green and blue values shown numerically. This is the CIE system working. So the CIE, CIE system is a standard for digital photography and it's a system that we'll look at next semester when we're looking at colour management. So it's a system for defining colours in colour management systems. So in photography we're working with light and we work with what's called an additive colour scheme and it's based on light. So the primary colours of light are red, green and blue. RGB. Equal amounts of red, green and blue light produce white light. So combination of equal amounts of the two pri any two of those primary colours will produce secondary colours. So that is red and green in equal amounts will produce yellow light. Green and blue in equal amounts will produce that secondary colour cyan. Blue and red will produce magenta. So with, when we're talking about light and colour of light, RGB are your primary colours, 
and yellow, cyan and magenta are your secondary colours. In subtractive colour scheme, um, which refers to, once again, remember pigments and paints, it's about mixing those colours. And the primary colours there are your um, yellow, blue and red. By mixing red, yellow and blue, or any two of those colours, you'll end up with your secondary and tertiary colour schemes. So there is a difference with the language about colour and when it comes to print or visual arts and photography. But the basis is that each one of those colours, uh, we have primary colours, secondary colours, when two primaries are mixed, is, gives you a secondary colour. Three primaries mixed may give you a, a, will give you a tertiary colour. But what about how is colour used in image design? And that's what the, the, the specific um, aim of this lecture is. How can we use this information about colour in our image design? So colour may be used to define elements. We've already spoken about those visual elements of line, shape, form and pattern. So if we apply colour to any of those elements, it's going to just assist with the formation or the def definition, the defining of those elements. Colour in image design may be used for separation of the elements, creating dominance of the elements, and also remember the tonal range of colour. When we're using colour in image design, um, it can be used to define elements such as line, shape and form pattern. It can be used as a, a tool to, to create separation between the elements, dominance and tonal range. Colour can also be used to create harmony and or contrast. Colour can also create emotion. Let's break these down. Colour can define line, shape and form. So what am I saying is that colour can be used in its purest form to create graphic elements or pictorial structure within your photograph. And for some photographs can be absolutely reliant on colour. And it is the colour which is the main visual element. So what we're going to look at is a few photographs here which are great examples of use of colour as um, in image design. But I want you to compare the, I've converted them to black and white. So let's just compare them. So this photograph from Les Walkling with these really warm dominant three poles in the centre with a road moving back in the same colour and against a bright blue sky. When that's converted to black and white, all of a sudden those pictorial elements, those graphic elements of the poles and the road disappear. Can you see the difference there? And again, let's look at Franco Fontana. So Franco's work is all about colour. He creates these abstracted city um, industrial landscapes, but it's all about use of colour. So looking at this image of Franco Fontana's where he's got the yellows, reds, blues and oranges offset by some beautiful neutrals as well, when it's converted to black and white, what's happened to his image? All of a sudden you do have that tonal range, but the strength of the image was absolutely in that contrast between the red, yellow and orange colours sitting side by side. Can you see how Franco Fontana as well, that there's huge planes or, of colour, so shape, the yellow shape, the red shape, the blue shape, the orange shape, it's the colour that is the eye-catching feature in these images. Another quick one from Christian Fletcher, so one of the aerial landscapes, and I've shown a few of these images to you during these lectures. But look what happens to Christian's image. So as he's seen and shot it, it's that deep red of the land um, and contrasted with the ocean and then the deep water. When it's converted to black and white, look what happens. Yes, once again, there's some tonal values there, but the strength of that image is 
in the colour, in that contrasting colour that he's used um, to create graphic elements within the, the photograph. Another one from Franco Fontana. So this is just, um, I don't know where he finds his photos, but they're just really quite interesting. And it's just, looks like some signage on a roadway or something. The photograph is a series of shapes, red, orange, uh, red and orange with white and a black line. Converted to black and white, look what happens. It's very flat and all of a sudden the interest in the image is gone. And the last one, Martin Parr. So this aerial view of people on the beach, bright colour, beautiful design, using just colour, repeated um, shapes, similar shapes, similar colours, a really busy image. So when I've converted that to black and white, look what's happened. So the colour is gone, but the shape and, for shape and form is still there, but it's absolutely not as strong an image as when it was in colour. So some photographs absolutely 100% rely on colour to build up the design or the graphic elements within the photograph. Other photographs convert beautifully to black and white. So don't be scared to use strong, bold colour in images and look for, for scenes that have those contrasting colours as well. So when I think about contrast of elements, so that separation, the dominance of elements through colour and or tonal range, and it creates difference, it creates conflict, and sometimes it creates opposition. So you can just do this with colour. Let's look at um, this photograph. This is a Peter Eastaway, um, another aerial landscape, but it, these aerial landscapes just bring you abstracted colour. So look at the way he's seen this image. That strong blue line right next to the strong red line and then it goes white. So we've got the sand, the blue, the red, the white and then the blue of the ocean. And the way that the blue and red line sitting next to each other create a strong contrast and they intersect, it's a diagonal line intersecting directly through the centre of that um, photograph. Just beautifully done. So once again, if you imagined, if you thought about that um, converted to black and white, you would lose the essence of that blue-red contrast right into um, the centre of, of the frame. Something a little bit different. William Eggleston, also new, that by using colour, you could create that dominance of elements. So this, William Eggleston's known for his um, streetscape type of photography in the US and everyday objects, so the banal is what he specialises in. But let's have a look at what he's photographed here. So it's some type of um, shop in suburbia candy colour stripe yellow and green nothing special there but that wow that shop is so bright that shop front and the, the awning but let's see how it's contrasted against that bright blue sky so we've got the bright blue sky the bright yellow awning and then a pop of colour how fortunate that there's a bright red car parked right in the front of this shop so he's like Peter Eastway, he's seen that opportunity when we have this huge amount of contrast between the colours, the blue, the yellow and the red. Trent Park, this is one of his interesting photographs. Uh, I always wonder about this one. It, Trent seems to have a wonderful sense of humour with his photos. But when we think about contrast of elements, no, how to create dominance, difference, conflict and opposition. So the, the deep red lounge suite, bright orange wall, gaudy. And then um, up on the right hand side of the frame is, looks like a yellow, uh, sorry, a bright green crocheted coat hanger hanging. There's a whole series of coat hangers hanging um, off the of the um, conduit for the power there. And, um, but only one of them is a different colour. So he's got a single colour scheme going on here with the orange red 
and then this bright green. So it's just that one little pop of colour that catches your eye, that um, keeps you, the viewer um, attentive to the image. And it, you know, it's a bit of a sense of humour as well. So what I've been describing to you are colour schemes. So through the use of colour schemes, we can create either harmony or contrast. When I think of colour schemes, there's three major ones to, to think about. So complementary colour scheme, analogous colour scheme, and also the warm, cool colour combination. So complementary colours are opposite each other on the colour wheel. So if we have a look at this, you know, the colour wheel, which you, you know, would have looked at since primary school, where we have a range of colours from red to blue to yellow. So this is a traditional visual arts colour wheel used to describe pigments or paints, okay? So complementary colours are opposite each other on the colour wheel and they produce high contrast colour. So if you think, go back to William Eggleston's, if you think about what we have here, William Eggleston has yellow against blue, nearly, nearly perfect complementary colour. And then we have red against the yellow, Abs once again, nearly comp complementary colour scheme. So what he's done, he's picked colours from opposite sides of the colour wheel to sit aside each other to create a high contrast scenario. So let's have a look at some more complementary colour schemes so that you can get a really good understanding of how these work um, to create that high contrast conflict in, within the elements. Tony Hewitt, I love these um, aerial views of the landscape. So Tony Hewitt has used this red earth again, so you saw that in Peter's photograph earlier. But look what's either side of the red is greens. So the green of the ocean, green back to the land. And so red opposite green on the colour wheel are beautiful opposites, so they're complementary colour scheme. But can you see how that red pops? So if you think about putting any other colour behind there, it wouldn't be quite so, um, like, quite so contrasty. Murray Fredericks part of his SALT series. So once again, Murray has used the strength or his knowledge of colour theory to create strength within this image. So the blue sky reflected in the water of Lake Eyre, but he's caught this image right on sunrise or sunset when that, that light is blood red, it's so dark. So once again, we've got this wonderful complementary colour scheme going on. Trent Park again. So this is part of his Christmas bucket series, I think. So the backlit yellow curtains are vibrant and the television screen just left to go to, to noise um, is blue. So once again, he's used his knowledge of colour theory to yellow, on blue as opposite, so that's a complementary colour scheme. Norel Autios. So this is a series that she took on um, female lifesavers down in Sydney. So the red and yellow, the bright red and yellow of the lifesavers suit contrasted against the green blue of the ocean is just brilliant. So it, it makes the photographs themselves vibrant with when you use these contrasty colours. The final one, another one from Franco Fontana. I just love the way he uh, has seen and captured colour. Purple orange, something they don't always see in a photograph. But purple orange, once again, complementary colour scheme. If you think about, you now you look at this, our little colour wheel, look where purple and orange sit against each other. Analogous colour, though, is quite different. So analogous colour is when you select a primary, a secondary, and out of the same um, series of 
colours. So if you think about your blue, you've got blue and di two different shades of blue, blues and purples, blue, purple, pink, orange and yellow, or green and yellow. So it's about having colours that sit next to each other on the colour wheel. So once again, let's just have a look at some, um, some photographs that demonstrate this use of analogous colour. So go back to uh, Murray Fredericks and his salt series again. This is very different to the other photograph that I showed you just before. Murray's been able to change the mood of the, the, the photograph quite dramatically just by photographing at a different time of day and which has provided him with a different colour scheme. So look at these beautiful blues, pinks through to off-white. It's their beautiful, calm and natural colours. The same sort of colours are evident here in Les Walkling's, one of his Pilbara project images. Same sort of beautiful pale blues, similar colours, they're all blues but different tones of blue. The only other colour in both of those images is this pink colour. The last one I want to show you is William Eggleston's. So even though you've got analogous colours, it doesn't mean that it's soft and harmonious and um, no, it doesn't have to be that softness because it's about the colours that you choose. So of course if you choose those lovely soft blue-pink hues, it's going to be calming. If you pick those lovely green-yellow hues, it's going to be once again lovely and calm. But what if you start choosing the red, orange um, and yellow hues, which are still analogous colour scheme, but they're vibrant. They're warm, vibrant colours. So look at William Eggleston's photograph here, beautifully seen. When you do look at this photograph carefully, the majority of the colour are, is analogous. So it's the red of the McDonald's sign, the yellow of the McDonald's um, logo, the big um, golden arches. And next, the next shop on the street is Photo Hut, which has the Kodak colours, which are once again um, red and, and orange. So he's just got red cars, red awnings, orange buildings, no, red signage and it's all out of that same um, family, the red orange on that one side of the analogous colour. The only difference with this one is that he has captured a man striding through the centre of this photograph and that gentleman's got a green shirt. So this isn't a true example of analogous colour but that person in the green shirt because he's so small he is not dominant in the image. When you look at this image, you think about what you find is the most dominant element. For me, it's the McDonald's signage. Not sure if that's because I've been programmed that way, but I don't think so. I think it's because that yellow is the most vibrant or the most saturated colour within the frame. So another type of colour scheme is warm and cool colours. So what are warm and cool colours? If you think about the red through to yellow, you're in your warm colours. When you think about the green through to the lavenders, then you're in the cool colours. So let's have a look at this. I've, I've put a little illustration here for you to have a look. So green, cyan, blue are cool colours. Yellow, red, magenta, warm colours. How can we use that schema of cold warm contrast in our image design? Well, let's think about this for a minute because I know that cool colours recede and warm colours advance. If you think about when you look out towards wherever you live, look towards the distance. Is there some mountains there? Is there anything that you can see? What colour are your mountains? And they're always a bluish colour. This is an anomaly, an atmospheric anomaly, which is called Rayleigh's scattering theory, where light will disperse in the atmosphere the further away it is from where you're viewing it. 
but we don't have to get quite bogged down in there. But if you're interested, have a look at Rayleigh's scattering theory. So cool colours recede, warm colours advance. So when you want dominant colours within your photograph, what colour will you choose? Well, maybe. If you want that colour to be front and centre to the viewer, why don't you pick a warm colour? Why don't you put a warm colour against a cool colour? And all of a sudden that warm colour um, advances towards, and even sometimes it becomes quite dimensional, you know, moving towards the front of the frame. Let's have a quick look at this photograph, uh, this Les Walking photograph. Look how he has used a mixture of cool and warm. In the foreground, the sand dune is one shade of orange. It's vibrant, it's saturated, it's got high luminosity. Okay, so how much more has that sand dune advanced towards the, the viewer? Do you feel that you can reach out and touch it? Above that sand dune is, a, it looks like, afternoon clouds. So think about when the sun's setting and you've got those beautiful storm clouds forming and, um, and the bottom clouds are starting to get lit up by that late afternoon sun. So Les has been in the right place at the right time here. So he's got this contrast of warm clouds against the cold, that dark, stormy, blue, no, dark blue clouds behind. So the clouds themselves become quite three-dimensional and those warm clouds are advancing. So what has happened is that the clouds themselves are reaching forward in the frame. It's hard to understand, but you need to look at this and examine it quite closely to see what's happening. Another one from Les, and this time he's used once again, that knowledge of warm and cool to define elements in the landscape. So the saltbush plants are a little bit cyan in colour, and that's just their colour. But when you put them against that deep red ochre of the outback, all of a sudden there's once again that huge amount of separation between the warm and the cool. He's also used the, you know, if you look at this photograph, three quarters of the frame is filled up with the red ochre, you know, the rock and the dirt. And the other third is that very vibrant blue sky. So he's used those two colours once in the first place just to break up the um, area within the frame into one third, two thirds. So just thinking about the, that contrast between warm and cool and you can use it quite smartly to um, create a huge amount of depth in your photograph. I've got two here now from Richard Muldoon and I think you can see how Richard as well has really worked on this um, theory that you know, warm colours um, will advance and cool colours recede. So he's, these are shot in the US, I know that because he, he won some wonderful awards with them um, a couple of years ago. But look at the colour of the mountains in the, in the background. With careful ed editing, even you can enhance this. So you can make the, um, the, you can clean up the foreground and make it even warmer. But can you see how the, both of these photographs make it look like he's, that Richard's photographed in a massive area. No, it's, it looks much larger than what it actually is. So it's just beautiful. Another one from Murray Fredericks. So let's have a look at this. So this is a different time of day again, or afternoon I should say, because it's that, that warm light again. Warm colours advance cool colours recede. This photograph, another one from his salt series, just looks like he's, he's photographing into a void because of the way that he has used less of, of the warm and more of the, of the cool around it. It just, it does look like, um, to me it looks like, no, just a void. 
but those, those cool colours are so dominant in this image and it just, it just makes you move right back into the frame. And there's just that softness of the warm to separate it and try and move forward. So in some ways it's, it's pushing and pulling the viewer in and out of the photograph. So just one more from Murray Frederick. See how it's doing that again in this one. This time with that bright, vibrant yellow horizon line, but the, the deep blue of the late um, twilight is creating that look. It feels like a void. This one's a little bit more complex. So Stephen Shaw, um, if you have like to have a look at some of his work, um, Stephen has a whole series where he's just shot motel rooms in the US. Not all of them are as nice as this one, but this is really interesting colour-wise. So let's examine the way that Stephen Shaw has used a combination of warm and cool colour schemas to um, create depth, exactly the same as these other photographers have done, depth within his photograph. All the colours in this image are warm except for the lounge suite and the carpet and the print above the lounge suite which has some cooler colour tones. But the shade of the carpet or the, the colour of the carpet is you no know, in direct relation to the pink of the walls. It works with the open doorway so the open doorway is like a portal and your eye is drawn directly through those doorways because of the cool colour. So cool colours recede and warm colours move forward in the frame. So when we think about colour, I've, I've talked to you about complementary colour schemes, analogous colour schemes, I've talked to you about warm and cool colour schemes, but when we think about colour, let's think about monochrome colour just before we leave here. So monochrome colour is a single chroma of colour. Monochrome colour is not a black and white, okay? It's a single chroma of colour. Quite often it is confused with the black and white, but it's quite different. So what's monochrome colour? So I've given you another William Eggleston one here. Single chroma, yes. A little bit upset by the poster down the ro bottom right-hand corner, but that's just the way William photographs. Bright red ceiling, bright red walls, and the only other difference to that is the light bulb and the white wires that lead to the white bulb in the centre of the room. Good example, monochrome colour. So when you want absolute dominance of the single colour within an image, monochrome colour is the way to go. So this deep, menacing red with that single light bulb it emits a, a huge amount of emotion. And we'll go into that just a little bit later in the, um, in the lecture. But let's compare that to another one from Murray Fredericks. So the last one, William Eggleston's Deep Red, now Murray Re Fredericks' Deep Blues. So it's all blue, just different tones within the blues. So some darker, some lighter. These are examples of monochrome colour. So what's tonal range? I've said to you Murray Frederick's blue is all blue except for some's lighter, some darker. That's the tonal range within the blues. Let's have a look at a, at a monochrome, a black and white image, just to quickly understand tonal range. So Michael Kenner's photograph here of a mountain range, if you can imagine what this is going to look like in colour, the, um, the mountains, the furthest distance from the camera point, so f the mountains are the darkest in the front, lightest at the back, they would actually be a pale blue. But Michael Cannon never works with colour, he only works with black and white. But what he has successfully done is produced an image in black and white with beautiful tonal range. So when I'm talking about tonal range, it's a range between pure black and pure white and how many steps of tone between each of those. So further understanding, you know, talking about how we understand and view and work with colour. There's a phenomena called simultaneous contrast. And that's where colour may change its appearance 
with the surrounding or the background colour. Colour may even appear to change its, its tone or it changes its size. So this is a, it's an anomaly in how we see colour because if we, and I will give you a, a sample to work with in, um, in the learning resources, and I want you to open it up in Photoshop and I want you to use the, the colour picker tool and I want you to read the information. And you can see that the, all these colours are the same. They have the same um, colour numbers. But when you put colour against, no, some colours against um, together, when you contrast some colours together, they actually change their appearance. So simultaneous colour is when there is an error in um, how colour is registered visually with ourselves. The last topic that I want to deal with is the use of colour to create an emotional response in your viewer. So this is hard and fast science. It's not something that we just make up because we feel like it. But, um, but colour, remember as well, has got lots of cultural significance. So what I'm referring to is Western theory on colour. So if I you know, I'm sure if I go into other cultures there, that their colour theory is a little bit different. So colour and emotion is um, used broadly in the visual arts, design, cinema, the moving image. Colour is used so much in, in movies, in cinematography, to create that feeling in the viewer. It's used in marketing. You know, I wasn't really joking, those big um, golden M's were programmed. No, it's the right colour to catch your eye, offset against a red, yes, absolutely. Somebody's done their market research and they know that they're the two colours to go together. But I just want to specifically look at how photographic artists uh, are using colour to create that emotional response in the viewer. And it's when you start thinking about it, it's not that hard. So the first photographer I would like to show you is Gregory Crudson. He does this brilliantly. And I've got to tell you, Gregory actually uses cinematic lighting to light his scenes. He has stages. So if he can't find um, the, the right place to shoot, he will set a, a stage the same as film will. Okay? But look at this first one from um, Crudson. Can you see the old gentleman, he's, he's in the armchair watching television? Well, we assume he's watching television because when you're illuminated by a, a television set, you have that eerie sort of blue glow on your skin. But that whole room is filled with this eerie blue glow and it's a cyan, actually not a blue. I let my language right there. But there's a person in the kitchen that person in the kitchen is doing something else. So there's two rooms in this photograph. There's the living room, the lounge room, where there's an elderly gentleman sitting in a, in a chair, and there's somebody in the kitchen. One's bathed in natural light, the other one's bathed in this cold light. So when we think about you know, that cold light, um, it can be, it's about sadness you no know, in this type in that shade that he's using that that color it's about um, it is about sadness it's about you no know, it's it's maybe something a bit eerie things that just aren't right but when we put it into this type of image it's, it's about isolation it's about loneliness it's about grief it's about being by oneself of course, no, Crudson, he's a master of the theatricals, so he's set this up beautifully and he's shot it beautifully. So not only do you have the colour, but you also have the stance, you have the, you know, the expression. So it's quite interesting. The next photograph from Crudson's a little bit easier to, to unpack. If you get a chance, find some of the, on YouTube, you'll find some of Crudson's behind the scenes um, videos of how he sets these up. So Crudson, this is just a, an empty street, suburban street, and it looks like people have just gone missing. So it's that cinematic type of um, feeling in his images again. So a car parked in the middle of the um, intersection, the car is 
bathed in light. It does have light on it, so natural, clean, warmer light. And in the car is sitting a woman. When you look closely, there's a woman and she's, you know, she's lit by the interior light of the car. But the car door is just slightly ajar. But the colour temperature of the street around is that, once again, that really eerie blue colour tone that Gregory Crudson does so well. Shot, you know, look, this is er really early morning, late afternoon. You can see that hint of, um, you know, last light, warm light in the, in the background in the sky. And it's when the, you know, you think about when the street lights come on and but everything else is blue around it. Crudson has been really quite successful at producing a, a, an emotion that I'm describing to you. So I want you to look at Crudson's work and think about, start thinking about how he uses colour to produce an emotion in you as well. The next image from William Eccleston Again, is that spooky, eerie colour, but look at the colour he's used. So Eggleston's got the, the colour of the street lamp and the street lamp has bathed everything it's touched in this green glow, which is contrasted. So think about our complementary colour scheme, contrasted against this orange-purple sky. Eggleston is a master of colour and um, you just have to start looking at his work to understand how smart he is. There's a single yellow car parked and bathed under that street light, that eerie green street light. So he's got yellow green together, looped and no, lit by the street light, contrasted against really black areas of, of the buildings, but then the only other colour in the image is this purple and orange sky. Just beautiful. So how does this make me feel? Once again, it's that really strange isolating light. Isolating light because it's only at one pool of light in the darkness. Isolating light because that's a really weird, eerie green. I see it sometimes in, um, you know, when you're walking um, underway, um, underground pathways to go to train stations, it's that same eerie type of green. It, it, it makes me a bit uncomfortable type of colour. Nan Golden is another photographer for you to have a look at. Um, but her work is, once again, maybe, oh, sorry, maybe I've got some really um, depressing images here for you to look at. But Nan Golden's image here that we're looking at is all in those red tones. So red tones, red is normally an indicator of danger or be care, beware sort of colour. And when you look at the subject matter, so it's about mixing that colour with the correct subject matter. So her subject matter as well is confronting. So the colour tone that Nan has used and the subject matter work together to produce a, a, an emotion in me. And I look at it and I go, I'm a little bit confronted by it. Um, how do you feel is probably what I want to say. And all of us will look at these images a bit differently and we may feel a little bit different about the images as well because it's about our own emotional state and our own emotional history. Another one from Nan Golden, I just find this one is a little bit disturbing actually, the cyans, um, really muted cyans in this image. The, the person laying back in the bathtub with just that one shaft of warm light um, to one side of the face. Um, and the way that they're laying, it nearly appears as if they're laying in a coffin. So I want you to start thinking about, look at this image and think about how that image makes you feel. Once again, it's that blue, the warm, cool, com no contrast that I spoke to you about earlier in the lecture. And Nan Golden has used that to her advantage to make that the, the expression on this young person's face quite dominant. It's like a portrait of, of depression or loss or something like that because this person does look like they're, they're um, in a coffin with their hands crossed. Another one from Nan Golden. This time she's chosen 
quite odd tones, cyan, yellow, and like a green over, no, undertone to the image. So Nan Golden's subject matter is always about confronting her own demons and the demons in society. So, and this is what, how she uses colour to put this message across. If you take photographs with such a deep meaning, with natural, unfiltered light, it loses something in translation. It, it, you really do need to, to add extra colour just to help you um, to, to get the, the viewer in that frame of mind in the first place. Bill Hansen is also a magician. When it comes to working with colour and producing emotion in people, it doesn't matter if it's his portraits, his nudes, his landscapes, he's just got it nailed. So Bill likes to work in those same deep cyan muted tonal colours and he, he has a lot going on with his, with his colour. So this first one, um, the girl appears to be floating midair, but she's just laying back on, on a ledge or something here. But sh she's in those tones, those muted cyan tones, but contrasted against the bright city lights. So Bill Henson has a whole series of work where he um, works with adolescents, you know, um, children on the, the cusp of adulthood and how they're confronted by this at times and how adults are even confronted by this you know, change between adolescent and adult. But Bill has a lot more going on with his colour and I think you need to look at his portraits close up to see how complex the colour is that he, he does put together. So not only does he use those cyan tones but he also uses these magenta tones as well. And Quite often I look at the skin tones on his subjects and they looked bruised. They look like they're victims of some type of abuse. And to me that, that resonates with me. You might look at them and go, no, I'm not seeing that, Anne, but it's like a burnished, bruising type of magenta colour. So do look at um, Bill Henson's portrait work, especially his work with adolescents. This is another of Bill Hansen's, but this is an earlier work from him, his, and he did um, his Paris Opera um, project, where he photographed people at the opera in, in Paris without them knowing that he was photographing them. So the light, the colour in these images is from the stage lighting and from the darkness. So you now you have that cyan, that undertone when you're photographing in the darkness at times. But it's a little bit, once again, that sinister feel, you know, that cyan gives you that feeling of apprehension as if something maybe is going to happen or something maybe is happening that's not quite as it seems. So it just puts you as the viewer on edge. When you look at how Bill translates his colours into his landscapes, look, they're exactly the same really deep shadows, really um, no, deep dark tonal range in his, um, in his landscape. But always that, you no, know, the colour is always towards that cool colour tones, those cyans, those, those darker blues. It's part of Bill's way of translating what he feels about his world, whether it be portraits, whether it be the landscape, whether it's just photographing people unknown to them in the opera, he has this beautiful way of using colour to express, express an emotion in his image. Trent Park's doing much the same. He usually uses colour as his design elements, but he, he's, he's also got really good at using colour as that, that emotive tool as well. So looking at this Trent Park one, there's once again that beautiful deep blue sky it's a streetscape, but it's a dark street. It's late afternoon. And the only, you know, the, the sign exotic is lit up. So we also have the contrast of colour between the yellow of the late afternoon sun hitting the shop front with the blue sky. But what do you think? Now you're looking at this, the colour is not natural. The colour is more to the cooler side. The colour is more to those cyans. 
Another one from Trent Park. I know this is shot with a sense of humour, but the colour that he's used here is really effective to, um, to you know, convey a mood or a feeling. So it's those green cyans again, but there's a massive Bugs Bunny toy or um, cut out in behind the, the semi-transparent um, curtains there. So the toy looks like a monster in behind the curtains. All the furniture in the, the room just about are in silhouette. It's just his brilliant use of colour, but also the way he's designed the image, how he's used a lack of light. You know, so he's, he's got most of the elements in darkness, in pure darkness. So one last one for Trent Park. So let's think about this. If red is a colour that we may associate with danger or stop, no, what colour is that stop sign, red? And if yellows and blues are colours that we associate with perhaps some sort of happiness, some sort of joy, some sort of light-heartedness, let's break down this last Trent Park photograph just for a moment. I just love this one and I'm sure he had lots of fun putting this one together. I call this the red zone and the UN on sitting on the horse. So we've got two children in the red zone. There's a red zone. Why do I call it that? There's a red bookcase. Two children, one in a red top, one in a dark pink, nearly red top. And they're fighting. So I think this is from his Christmas bucket series. So over in the red zone, there's war. Two kids want to kill each other. Over in the peaceful zone um, is a child sitting on a rocking horse. She's against a cream curtain. There's two yellow curtains either side and um, the yellow curtains are against a blue wall. So this is our cool, our calm, our, our peaceful zone. So we have two zones in this room. One is the, the war zone and the other one is the peace zone. So she's even looking on with these children fighting like, oh yeah, they're fighting, not getting involved. So even if you don't have a, an adjustment of colour temperature within an image, is what I'm trying to say, you can use colour quite smartly to actually indicate that something's going on in the image. Trent Park just does this so well with, with humour um, in his work. So that's it for our, um, our lectures on image design and composition. I hope there's something valuable in this lecture about the use of colour. So remember, colour can be used as um, to build up pictorial or graphic elements within your image. It can be used to create contrast, to create conflict. It can also be used to create harmony. So if you have those happy colours grouped together, analogous colour scheme, so some nice yellow greens or some blues and pinks, you have this calm and peaceful sort of scenario in your images. If you start putting you know, your complementary colours together, your, your reds and your greens, your oranges and your purples, and you have high contrast colour, then you're setting up for areas of dominance or you no know, or in, in the image. If you just have a pop of colour, like you know, the red car from, from William Eggleston, so the red car against the yellow building, against the blue sky, so it's the only different colour. It's a warm colour against all the, the, you know, the cools. So, so you, you're setting up an area, a, 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 a design where you have that contrast or conflict of elements. So colour can be used as a graphic, you no, know, as graphic uh, designing graphic elements in your, in your photograph. It can be uh, helpful to put emotion into your photographs. It can indicate some sort of underlying meaning in your photographs, like Trent Parks with his, with his red zone and his, his yellow zone. So have a play with colour. Have a play with um, adding emotion to your images with colour. Have fun looking for colour in the environment and photographing it. And um, just see what you can do with your photographs. Thank you.